بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آن بہاف آف پاکستان سوسائٹی آف ہیمٹالی آئی ویلکیو آل ان دس سیشن دس لنچی آن سیشن وی ہیو ٹو سپیکر ویڈ آس دی ڈاکٹر سمینہ امانت دی فرسٹ سپیکر شیز ای کنسلٹنٹ ہیمٹالوجسٹ ہیڈ آف دی ڈپارٹمنٹ آف پیتھالوجی این پاکستان ایٹومک انرجی کمیشن ہسپیٹل اسلام آباد شی ویل بی ٹاکنگ آن دی چیلنجز ان دی مینجمنٹ آف سیویر اے پلاسٹک انیمیا And the second speaker is Dr. Natasha Ali. She is Associate Professor of uh, Pathology, Aachan University Hospital, and Consultant Hematologist and Bone Marrow tra- uh, Transplant Physician. She will be talking on the role of il pack in the management of chronic ITP. I will first request Dr. Samina Amanat to please uh, talk on this challenges in the management of a plastic, severe a plastic anemia. بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم تھینک یو ٹو دا آرگنائزرس فار انوائٹنگ می اینڈ میکنگ دس ارینجمنٹ مائی ٹاک از اباؤٹ دا چیلنجز ان سیویئر اے پلاسٹک انیمیا مینجمنٹ ویل ان فیو ورڈس اے پلاسٹک انیمیا کین بی ڈیفائنڈ ایز پین سیٹ اوپینیا ود ہائپو سیلورو میرو اٹ کین اٹ از اے سیریس کنڈیشن وچ کین بی فیٹل اینڈ اٹ کین افیکٹ anyone of any gender living anywhere and of any age uh, the mm, incidence between the females and the males is same and the age distribution is biphasic it can uh, first peak is in the young adults and the second uh, second in the older adults now briefly the pathophysiology of the uh, aplastic anemia I will just summarize the mechanisms involved and they are direct this direct destruction of the hemopoietic progenitor cells or there may be distrib- uh, disruption of the marrow micro environment uh, which includes fibroblasts and monocyte signaling pathway or more commonly there is immune mediated suppression of marrow elements uh, by the cytotoxic T cells in blood and marrow which release uh, gamma interferon, TNF, and which inhibit early and late progenitor cells. So in this picture, you can st- I can just summarize these uh, stem cells. They are uh, hit by the in- environmental insult, which could be viruses, drugs, toxins, radiations, etc. And they alter the uh, stem cell genetically. Either there is a derangement is uh, that these progeny of the stem cells, they express new antigens that evoke an autoimmune reaction or give rise to the clonal population with reduced proliferative capacity. Either way, the end result is aplasia of the marrow. Now, clinical features are related to the uh, reduced RBC leading to anemia and the signs and symptoms of anemia due to leu- neutropenia and leukopenia. Patients are prone to infections and uh, thrombocytopenia of course patients will be having bleeding tendencies which could be mild like petechia um, ecchymosis or could be serious like uh, intracranial cranial hemorrhages uh, it, we can uh, classify uh, aplastic anemia into the constitution inherited type and aplastic uh, anemia although mostly they are acquired aplastic anemia in adults but um, It has been uh, increasingly recognized that inherited type of aplastic anemias are uh, more common as uh, compared to previously thought. And they can affect present in the adults, not just in the children. Acquired aplastic anemia has many uh, um, uh, causes, which include radiation, drugs, chemicals, viruses, immune disease, pregnancy-induced. PNH leading to aplastic anemia and uh, diseases which can uh, replace the marrow and uh, uh, cause uh, pancytopenia. Patient can present, some of the patients they are asymptomatic and they are accidentally uh, diagnosed when they are tested for uh, something else. And, but the uh, symptom of the bleeding in severe type is the most alarming for which the patients, they seek medical advice. Diagnosis of uh, aplastic anemia uh, at times is not very straightforward. Um, 
because at times there is very difficult they become tricky to diagnose differentiate between severe aplastic anemia and mds especially hypoplastic mds especially in the older age group diagnosis includes as we know there are so many etiological factors so diagnosis include um, detailed history and physical examination to determine the uh, potential cause for uh, aplasia and um, then of course to exclude the constitutional type of uh, aplastic anemia and finally the lab investigations among these the peripheral blood showing pancytopenia bone marrow examination to exclude uh, other diseases like leukemias dysplasias fibrosis and karyotyping and finally the another mandatory test which is now required is the exclusion of sanguinis anemia so uh, the diagnosis of aplastic anemia is ex to rule out ex it's a diagnosis of exclusion so we rule out other all the causative agents and also uh, perform the routine investigations like renal hepatic and thyroid function the most the hallmark of the diagnosis the test is bone marrow bone marrow aspiration alone cannot uh, be considered as a test to diagnose aplastic anemia to find biopsy is mandatory to exclude leukemias mds metastatic infiltrates etc so this is a classical picture which we can see there's a, a replacement by the fatty tissue there's no fibrosis no abnormal infiltrate in case of uh, when there's a difficulty between uh, the diagnosis of a hypoplastic mds and aplastic anemia cd34 positive cells usually help because they are reduced in aplastic anemia and normal or increased in mds and also peripheral blood flow cytometry should be done to rule out pnh now hot this uh, aplastic anemia is a variable disease its presentation is variable the clinical course is variable we can broadly divide them into uh, uh, three groups the first one who have asymptomatic uh, are asymptomatic and have stable pancytopenia which uh, stays for months or years and then another course in which there is progressive or uh, fluctuating aplasia which initially starts with the uh, unilinear cytop uh, cytopenia but finally uh, rapidly progresses to uh, true aplastic anemia and in the third group there are patients who have unstable aplasia and then they show improvement but the improvement in counts may be associated with abnormal clones pnh clone is seen in 20 percent of the long-standing aplastic anemia and often only detected by lab tests and not clinically significant so this is uh, for di diagnosing the severe aplastic anemia and very severe we use the committers criteria because these are the two types in which we need urgent treatment so management after the identification and elimination of the underlying cause so, uh, regardless of the etiology supportive therapy is same for all the aplastic anemias because red cells are trans uh, transfusion is required to uh, for the anemias but the important thing is that as these patients are the prospective candidates for the bone marrow transplants so um, direct family donors should not be uh, used because they can cause sensitizations to myra hl antigen and which can uh, reduce uh, increase the rate of graft rejection then prevention and treatment of hemorrhage by using platelet transfusions and of course uh, using hormone therapy in the females to for the menorrhagia and transamine etc then prevention and treatment of infection as these patients are very much prone to infections so or guiding about the oral hygiene general uh, hygiene etc the definitive therapy of a, uh, the severe aplastic anemia includes uh, either the bone marrow transplant or stem cell human uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant and immunosuppression which is called immunosuppressive therapy ist whenever patient of uh, is diagnosed as severe aplastic anemia the stem cell transplant is the best option is the treatment of choice offered to the patient if they are young 
and uh, because it has uh, it corrects the hemopoietic defect it has gives long term survival in 80% uh, to 90% of the patients in the HLA match match sibling donor and the majority of the patients they appear to cure so whenever we diagnose patient is diagnosed as severe having severe aplastic anemia the first step that should be taken is to uh, get his uh, HLA typing and his family members HLA typing and um, uh, because uh, but having said this uh, there um, are restrictions to this because uh, the results of hemopoietic stem cell transplant are only good in the younger patients so the cut off age limit is 40 years and the suitable donor available is uh, available less than 30% uh, of the cases. Moreover, there is increased risk of uh, GVHD, which occurs in 5 to 15% of the cases, and the risk of rapt failure, especially in the multi transfused uh, patients. Then, uh, the other type of uh, match, unrelated stem cell transplant, they of course have high mortality and there is complication of solid tumor. Now the standard regimen which is still used is uh, for the conditioning uh, of the patient is uh, Psi 200 ATG. Uh, now in the, uh, which and the, for the GVHT we use methotrexate and um, cyclosporin. Now, mm, they in the use of the other patients who do not have matched sibling donor and have severe aplastic anemia, the option which is, um, the choice which is given to them is IST. Now, IST can also uh, give short-term survival with good and uh, to excellent uh, uh, response that is more than it in more than 80% of the cases. And the cyclosporine uh, is, um, is given along with it and it is usually given to six months and then there's slow tapering of it. Time frame for response typically is three to six months. We call it complete response when there's a normalization of the count and partial response when there's uh, transfusion independence and lower infection risk. But the persistent abnormal hematopoiesis is the um, problem which uh, cannot be excluded uh, in the patients who are on IST. Yeah, there is uh, evolution of the abnormal clone, uh, especially in the pediatric uh, clonal uh, disease occurs at 10% uh, at 10 years of the disease. The, in IST, the backbone regimen is again ATG and cyclosporine and ATG the anti human T cell comes from the sources of horse and rabbit and it uh, it is basically contains anti CD2 3 4 5 uh, 6 8 and uh, CD25 antibodies so basically destroys or eliminate the T cells and uh, steroids because it has uh, certain side effects to so steroids are added along with it to prevent the serum sickness and uh, uh, other drug, which is cyclosporine, it has a mechanism which it also inhibits proliferation of the T cells and by binding to the cy uh, cytosolic immunophilin receptor, and also inhibits inducible uh, gene transcription T cells. It also inhibits pro uh, production of IL-2 and interferon gamma. Then other drugs like uh, which are also being used, FK506 and MMF, which also block the T cell activation by another mechanism and may stimulate hematopoietic colony uh, formation. And small studies have shown in the pediatric group good response. Now, the most challenging thing about the ATG is its side effects, which uh, when occur in the patients, they uh, give a lot of problem and uh, allergic reactions include fever, rigors, urticaria, anaphylaxis and so pre-treatment with steroids, antihistamines and mepidine should be given and more of the uh, tip is that should be given the patients who have this allergic tendency the infusion should be given a very slow uh, taking 12 hours to finish one infusion. Then serum sickness, which is also a deadly complication, which uh, involves fever, um, mac uh, involves literally any, all the system can involve all the system of the body with the uh, fever, maculopapular rash, myalgia, arthralgia, etc. And its usual time frame is five to 10 days after starting 
ATG. So to combat this, um, uh, steroids are used to reduce the intensity or to avoid the serum sickness. And another complication of the ATG is it uh, developed uh, immune-mediated cytopenias. Uh, platelets transfusion is constantly required in these patients. And lymphopenia can make the uh, patients more susceptible to pneumocystis uh, infection. The side effects of cyclosporine uh, includes T cell inhibition, hypertension, hirsutism, gingival hypertrophy, nephrotoxicity, and hypomagnesemia, which can cause seizures. So when we are giving this treatment, there should be a very vigilant monitoring system to uh, identify and treat these uh, complications. So uh, we have an, you know, uh, bone marrow transplant versus uh, ATG, uh, IST. So both these um, uh, give 80 to 90 percent transfusion independence. And uh, IS, but IST, in IST there are higher rates of relapse and there's clonal evolution. And if we see the different shapes of the disease-free survival curve, we will find out that in the IST patients, it is the curve is better in the first six months, short term survival, but it curves continues to decline as far out as um, as six to 10 years. Whereas in the hemopoietic stem cell transplant patients, the curves plateau after two years. So uh, the main problem, the challenge is, you know, the transplant uh, mass sibling donor in the severe aplastic anemia can be offered in less than 30% of the patients and the rest of which are offered IST in these in this group, about 50% of the patients either relapse or uh, show no response to the therapy. So these are the patients basically who are a uh, challenge for us how to treat these patients. Uh, unrelated donor transplant, uh, nowadays, the people are trying their best to improve the conditions, to modify the therapies, because in the patients who are in the older age group, Cyto, uh, cyclophosphamide uh, provides uh, um, uh, too much of toxicity. So in the recent um, EBMT data, they have seen that the fludarabine-based uh, conditioning regimen uh, are, uh, shows good improved response. And moreover, the selection of the donor should be, is also very important. Um, 30 year, less than 30 year, and the male donors have better um, outcome than the female donors and elderly donors. Moreover, reduce intensity protocols can be tried in these patients. So uh, the patients who have uh, no, uh, not availability of any uh, match donor and who um, have uh, not responded or relapsed by IST, they are the main challenge. So what we can do, we have to uh, search other avenues for these patients. So other medicines which are available, uh, cytokines, although alone uh, these GMCSF, they have no role. But if they are, uh, there's a recent studies in which they, if they are combined with the IST, they result in uh, early neutrophilic uh, production. And uh, uh, if the neutrophil production is positive in the plus 30 days, it means these patients are responding to the therapy. And if it is not present, at least they can tell us uh, that these patients are not re non responders. Then other drugs like MFMF, cyclophosphamide in high dose, especially in children, have shown promising results. I would like to uh, talk a few words about the uh, dinosaur, the androgens or anabolic steroids. These anabolic steroids were initially used when before the era of bone marrow transplant and um, IST, ATG was there. So these were the patients we have only, we had the option of either supportive therapy or giving these patients these androgens. And uh, some of the patients um, used to show response. So I think if we start using these patient, uh, medicine, we should reconsider them because Danazol in some recent studies uh, published in the blood and in the New England of Journal have shown that they um, 
increase the telomere uh, length in vivo and in vitro. So these uh, medicine, along with the standard IST, uh, will uh, definitely improve the results. Then other emerging uh, medicine uh, like thrombopoietin mimetics. In this group, El Thrombopag is a new player which is uh, being uh, uh, studied and used in the patients who are not fit for, who do not have transplant uh, option. Now, what is El Thrombopag? El Thrombopag, we are aware, uh, aware about this because we have been using this medicine in the ITP patients and in the uh, previously in the patients who of the hepatitis C who were treated, um, who had thrombocytopenia. So, to improve the platelet count, this medicine was used. Now, in uh, uh, severe aplastic anemia, it is, it, can, it is still indicated uh, in the case in the second line or third line therapy when the patients do not have a transplant option and they are not fit to have uh, or do not, did not have responded to the IST therapy. So in the recent uh, study where they added the Ultrombopag uh, with um, standard immunosuppression for aplastic anemia, they divided the patient in three cohorts. All the patients, they received the standard ATG plus cyclosporine. In the cohort one, they gave uh, Altrombopag, they added Altrombopag from the day 14 to uh, six months. And the second cohort, they added uh, Altrombopag from day 14 to, uh, to six, six months, sorry, to three months. And in the third cohort, they had started the Altrombopag right from the beginning from day one to six months. So the results, which we um, can see in this busy slide, that we can see that the overall result uh, of the third group, where the entrobo pack was started on the day one, have better results as compared to the other two cohorts. So this uh, medicine is showing some uh, promising uh, results. And uh, lastly, I will just summarize the uh, treatment for adults severe aplastic anemia. So when a patient comes, we at the age is less than 40 years, HLA identical sibling is available. Yes, we, this is the treatment of choice. But here I would like to say the studies of EB, uh, retrospective analysis of the EBMT, they have found that the bone marrow transplant, the source bone marrow for the stem cell is better than the peripheral stem cells. Because uh, the bone marrow uh, source provides not only the mesenchymal cells and also the micro environment. Uh, the, because in the aplastic anemia, uh, the niche where the, the stem cells are being um, uh, are present, are they divide and they uh, differentiate, is also disturbed. So bone marrow source is better than the peripheral blood stem cells. Then, if the patient doesn't have a match identical sibling donor, so the IST is the drug of choice with, with the ATG plus cyclosporine. So we uh, give this patient uh, give the patients this medicine and see the response uh, at four months. If there is response, then the important thing here is that cyclosporine should be tapered off slowly. We know that in most of the cases, it is an autoimmune mechanism which is causing aplasia. So the cases, because the incidence of relapse is very common at this stage. So if we uh, reduce slowly 10% in a month, even if you have to continue cyclosporine for a year or two years, that is okay. And the other group, when there is no response, Second uh, course of ATG can be given, but we have uh, the studies have shown the patient who has not respond to the first uh, course, their uh, percentage of response is only 30 percent to the second course of ATG. While the patients who have given response to the first course and relapse, they have 60 percent chance to give a response to the second course of ATC. So I think the patients who do not, who, who are, uh, have a good performance status and um, 
haven't shown response to IST, they should be offered uh, a bone marrow transplant. Now, after the uh, failure of the second ATG and cyclosporine, so what to do? Then we have options like um, matched unrelated donors. Uh, in that case, we, uh, we can optimize the uh, conditioning regimens. We can use, because these patients are elderly and, and they have uh, the performance state is not at, uh, so good. So we can optimize the regimens and um, uh, save these patients. And still, if the patients uh, uh, adequate, they have adequate performance status, only then we can go for bone marrow transplant. The other patients, we have to give them other medicines in which that I have already mentioned these new, uh, dr new drugs and the older drugs which we used to do, uh, use before the era of uh, transplant. So this is what we can do about the patient and there are still many challenges to address and lots and lots of patients are only on supportive therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I start with the second uh, speaker, I would like to, uh, the, uh, to introduce the expert panel. We have uh, the expert panel of uh, Dr. Nadeem Samad Sheikh. He is a professor of hematology and chairman uh, and dean of Department of Pathology, Bolan University of Medical and Health Sciences and director, Safe Blood Transfusion Project, Balochistan. The second expert is uh, Professor Vaseem Iqbal. He is a consultant and head of the department and chairman of the department of uh, PMC Air University. He is director of the clinical lab and previously working in RMC, Rifa University, uh, Bolan Medical University, uh, Bakai Medical University, and uh, Kasim University in KSA. He is a founding member of uh, Pakistan Society of Hematology. And the uh, third uh, expert is Dr. Jahanzebur Rahman. He is currently working as a consultant hematologist and assistant professor of uh, uh, pathology in Bhavalpur Medical uh, College and previously working as a consultant hematologist, Armed Forces Bone Marrow Transplant Center. Now I would like to uh, request Dr. Natasha Ali to please uh, uh, talk on the role of il pack in the management of chronic ITP. Dr. Natasha Ali, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I'm going to share my screen now. And um, my topic actually is management of ITP in adults. And I will be discussing um, the time-tested management and diagnostic evaluation in these patients. Um, and also some newer drugs which are now available to treat immune thrombocytopenia uh, in adults. So to save uh, bandwidth, I'm going to switch off my um, camera for the moment. And I can uh, take it on when we do question and answers. Um, and here we go. So um, the outline of the talk would be that I'll be discussing uh, incidents and pathophysiology. Uh, we'll touch upon the diagnostic approach um, of this disorder. Um, what are the treatment options, first line and subsequent therapies? And in the end, I will summarize. So I have nothing to disclose. Um, if you uh, look at the history of immune th thrombocytopenia, it is um, actually quite an ancient um, considerably prehistoric disease and uh, till date um, the pathophysiology has been um, given a lot of thought but some researchers still believe that it's purely un um, understood till date. Um, the main gist of the pathophysiology that it causes an antibody mediated suppression of the normal plated production and this is coupled with increased plated destruction. Uh, usually it has a benign course but um, few um, cohorts have reported fatal bleeding and about approximately 10% of patients have presented with severe non-intracranial bleed like GI or um, the pulmonary vasculature or uh, about 2%, just over 2% uh, patients have presented with intracranial bleed. The 
the definition um, of ITP is when the platelet count is 100,000 or less, and it commonly occurs in both adults and children. Uh, in children, uh, it has got a very benign and a self-limiting disease. And almost one week, or, or almost 80% of the children recover. But unfortunately, in adults, it can sometimes present as a chronic, lifelong debilitating disorder. The incidence in the U.S. has been reported as 3.3 per 100,000, and this is the latest data. In Pakistan, we don't have an incidence um, uh, exclusively for ITP, but there are various studies that have been published, and I'm quoting here one study um, from my institution where this was done in children, and there were about 417 patients, of which 35% um, presented with primary ITP, and rest um, had some underlying illness leading to thrombocytopenia. Um, so if we go through the pathophysiology, uh, this is how a normal platelet uh, is produced. You've got your hemopoietic progenitor, um, which is your megakaryoblast. That produces megakaryocyte, and megakaryocytes produce about 3,000 platelet, which um, bud off from the cytoplasm, come into the circulation, they complete their lifespan, and then they are taken up by the monocyte macrophage system and destroyed. Whereas in ITP, the problem starts right uh, at the level of the megakaryoblast, where these autoantibodies produced by the body um, come in combined with the megakaryoblast present over here. This then results in about abnormalities of megakaryopoiesis, and usually it is said that the abnormalities in megakaryopoiesis are less pronounced um, as compared to the abnormalities in thrombopoiesis, where if you see over here, the mature me megakaryocyte also has a host of autoantibodies on itself. This leads to a very abnormal proplatelet structure. When they're produced in the circulation, they are filled with autoantibodies attached with the platelets. This, when sensed by the monocyte macrophage system, senses that this is an absolutely foreign object. They engulf it and cause apoptosis. Therefore, um, there are some problems in the production of platelets, but the major problem lies over here when they come into the circulation and they are destroyed. So if you think of diagnostic approaches, um, this is the first three or four points are mandatory in uh, all patients who present with a hematological disorder. So you start off with a patient history, and this patient history is concentrated on um, basically hemostatic abnormalities. Um, if the patient has a history of bleeding, to trauma, to surgery, um, family history. Well, there 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 have been many prospective cohort trials uh, trials that have in the, that have clearly indicated that uh, ITP is not an inherited disorder. This is purely an acquired disorder. Physical examination pertains to the presence of ecchymosis, bruises, and active bleeding. CBC and reticulocyte and peripheral film complement each other to make sure that we're not missing any other cause of thrombocytopenia, mainly throm uh, pseudothrombocytopenia. This is more pronounced uh, um, and important in children and blood group if you're planning to give anti-D and, of course, viral etiologies. Um, so, the, uh, some tests which may give you potential utility in the management of an ITP patient are, of course, uh, the glycoprotein-specific antibodies not present in all labs. Um, of course, uh, antiphospholipid antibodies because thrombocytopenia is a presenting symptom here. Um, you want to make sure that you are not looking at a case of gestational thrombocytopenia. Of course, ANA uh, and viral PCRs for viral etiology. So here's a debate. For bone marrow examination, clearly not indicated in first go uh, in children and also not in adults anymore. Um, but then there are exceptions. If you have a patient who is 60 years or older, has presented with isolated thrombocytopenia, then myelodysplastic syndrome is one of uh, the diagnoses uh, that needs to be kept in mind. And in these patients, NGS is also indicated to rule out cytogenetic abnormalities. Um, few other tests that um, may be done, but they have not uh, uh, given any proven or, or certain benefits. So these, these tests over here can be easily, um, can be easily omitted. Um, so for, uh, if you uh, 
moving on before we move on to the uh, next class of um, to, the, to the next set of uh, the slides it's always nice to classify um, the uh, degree and the prof profundity of um, immune thrombocytopenia so uh, there are some terms that are important so um, for a newly diagnosed ITP um, you describe it as um, if it's uh, been less than three months in duration uh, if it persists for a year starting off at three months then it is persistent ITP um, more than a year is chronic ITP uh, severe obviously when there is clinically relevant bleeding and uh, of such a huge magnitude that it mandates treatment um, refractory this term has been limited to um, uh, splenectomy and presence of severe ITP post splenectomy and response criteria are two so there is one which is complete response which is this where you give a treatment and the platelet count uh, becomes more than 100,000 measured on two occasions seven days apart and then there is just response where you give a treatment and the platelet count is more than 30,000 on measured on two occasions seven days apart so these are uh, these are some um, terms that ne need to be kept in mind uh, when we talk about the uh, treatment modalities which are present right so this is a very very important question and this should be asked in every patient that you see in your clinic with ITP who should be treated um, so this has to be patient-centered I think this is the gist of the entire talk this has to be patient centered and there are many factors that contribute um, to taking this decision uh, your main aim should be to prevent severe bleeding episodes um, so the target level of platelet count um, has been around two schools of thought some say that it should be more than 20,000 while some say it should be more than 30,000 while few cohorts have quoted it as between 20 and 30,000 but suffice to say 20 is a good enough number because this at this number the risk of bleeding significantly decreases um, the other thing that should be kept in mind prior to initiating treatment is that you should be able to give them minimal amount of toxicity with your treatment um, increasing the platelet count and subsequently also linearly increasing their morbidity is not going to do your patient any good and that brings uh, uh, me to the to the last point uh, which is that you need to optimize uh, the health related quality of life when you're treating uh, these patients with ITP so this is a very nice overview that I came across uh, recently published where um, the researchers have a um, have uh, classified it into um, the initial treatment of a newly diagnosed patient um, adult with ITP uh, and then there are subsequent treatment which is medical and surgical so these drugs are time tested they have stood the right of time and um, they have given and you know they've many many studies have been published with their results um, uh, showing the overall benefit of using um, uh, the three drugs given over here when initially patients present uh, with ITP and we will take all of these drugs one by one so these have got a lot of robust evidence with them um, these have got um, good uh, robust evidence but not as good as these while these drugs have got the least amount of robust evidence with them while using them so we will not talk about this today but we'll concentrate on uh, this and this so um, many co uh, many studies have compared the efficacy between dexamethasone and prednisolone and you and methylprednisolone and you know uh, that corticosteroids are the mainstay of treatment um, in immune thrombocytopenia and um, uh, there is no um, uh, there is no preference as to which steroid uh, which class of steroid uh, should we use um, but this is a standard initial treatment um, there have been multiple small trials conducted and I have uh, given you a snapshot over here where random trials of a high dose dexamethasone and prednisolone have been compared so if you look at this part of the table um, uh, in two of the studies the p-value is not significant while there are two studies over here that have given a good evidence that uh, dexamethasone um, is a better off um, a drug as a better off drug as a steroid um, treatment for ITP but um, uh, but but in overall scenario uh, what these what these studies basically tell you is that dexamethasone 
leads to faster responses and uh, the exa does that without additional toxicity uh, but again till date there is no consensus as to which steroid is better so you 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 free to use methylpred dexamethasone and and cortico um, cortico steroids for that matter but steroids should be started first off uh, when you encounter a patient with it so the other first line treatment options that have been tried and tested are of course anti d and it works through the fc receptor blockade um so 50 microgram per kg is the fda approved dose but studies on 75 microgram per kg have also been done um uh, in adults and they have also shown this this dose has also shown good responses and this is the subsequent dose to give once you uh, achieve the initial result the other drug quite costly in our setting but um has given very good responses and especially indicated when there is life threatening bleeding um and patients require splenectomy uh, or in, and or emergency increase uh, in platelet count so this is uh, iv immunoglobulin again working through the fcr blockade mechanism over here where it uh, this uh, where it helps uh, where it does not make this antibody coated platelet bind to the monocyte macrophage system for its destruction and uh, the doses for ivig are two um, we can give either 400 mg per kg for 5 days or it can be also given as a two day regime where you give 1 g per kg for two days so um once you start off this treatment um you obviously will need to taper off the steroids maximum in 6 weeks time if your patients achieve um um the desired platelet count very good but if they don't then um you are uh, in for a good treat with um where with the treatment responses or the treatment options present later so um about 45 to 50% of adult patients will relapse uh, with thrombocytopenia after the cessation of steroid um you there will be few that can be maintained on daily low dose of steroids as low as 2.5 mg um and that's the problem that's the most consistent and prevalent error that we do in itp uh, is when we start using um uh, steroids over overly and depend on a lot of um uh, you know keep keep our reliance on steroids for these patients um so there are a lot of subsequent treatment um options that are now available but till date no study has addressed the current correct sequence of subsequent therapy so none of the none of the regimes have got um, a superiority over the other you um uh, may use them um mainly with subject to the availability and of course the cost So I'll start off with rituximab. Um, the standard dose of three seventy-five milligram per meter square for four weeks um, uh, weekly has given an overall response of about sixty-two percent. That's the maximum. Um, actually, that is the midway response, and in some studies with a count of more than thirty thousand, seventy-three percent was also achieved. Uh, now there have been studies that have looked at alternative doses. So one uh, uh, regime was one gram on days one and day fifteen. So this is a two weekly regime, and again, and the response have ranged from 60% to about 44% and the last was a 100 mg weekly for 4 weeks and um, again the response was between 50 and 60% so this is this is a very good response as compared to the um, uh, as compared to the platelet count that we like to achieve in these patients to prevent them um, from um, severe um, intracranial or non intracranial bleed now rituximab has been used in combination with the methasone also um and this is a this is a trial that compared a uh, combination therapy versus monotherapy of dexamethasone uh, there are about uh, 137 patients uh, randomized to um dexamethasone monotherapy and a combination therapy and clearly the two graphs separate very well with an effective p value of 0.0.3 uh, um so if given the option then dexamethasone and rituximab uh, do give uh, good results yielding platelet count of more than 50000 uh, for a good amount of time um a year or more than 2 years So this is a new class of drugs, and um, there are three or four drugs um, in this class that have um, that have been uh, given FDA approval. Um, uh, some very recently, and some half a decade ago. Uh, 
and um, uh, the mechanism of action of all of these and I can discuss this one by one the first one over here is romiplostin um, and the mechanism is that it binds to the TPO receptor and this causes a conformational change um, that uh, activates the JAKSTAT pathway over here resulting in um, uh, increased proliferation of megakaryocytes and of course um, increased differentiation of platelets. So romiplostin acts at this level which is the uh, level of the thrombopoietin um, uh, uh, attachment whereas l bag and ever bag acts at the uh, cell membrane level. So this is a, a peptide body that that uh, combines competitively while these are small molecules that combine at the cell membrane level uh, all causing increased transcription and enhanced proliferation of megakaryocytes. Um, so l bag had received um, approval um, about seven, eight years ago and then there were final results of the extent study that were published and there were about uh, 300, over 300 patients where the researchers looked at two kinds of counts, more than 50%, uh, more than 50,000 and more than 30,000. And the duration of responses continued to happen as the weeks progresses, as you can as you can see here. So the key points were that um, the patients were able to maintain uh, counts of more than 50,000 and they achieved it very rapidly. Uh, this was by week two and they maintained it for over two years. Uh, for patients um, who had failed previous therapies and had also failed spinectomy, the responses were not very good with all trauma back. So um, if your patient is going to fail at least two therapies, that um, then maybe l bag uh, will not be the drug for him or her. Uh, Evertrombobag, almost similar uh, compound like l bag, and this is again a trial where patients were randomized to um, the uh, dose of 20 milligrams and placebo, and some of the subjects were also enrolled in the extension, extension phase of the study, where they received an off-label dose and also a, a dose titration curve. And if you look at um, the summary of these two drugs, uh, where they were, where 32 patients were compared with placebo, the plated count was 50,000 and about 66% of patients with a significant, significant p-value. So l bag, ever um certainly a, a better treatment option uh, than, of course, placebo and, and patients who have failed first-line therapy, mainly steroids. Fostamatinib, so this is a new kid on the block and um, um, the, the mechanism of action is, is a bit complex uh, such, such that uh, it inhibits, so, so the spleen tyrosine kinase is responsible for the downstream signaling of a cytoskeletal um, environment that causes phagocytosis of this plate, antibody bound platelet. Um, and it is a it is a main regulator um, of the signal transduction pathways which are involved in development and uh, progression of um, autoimmune diseases like uh, of course rheumatoid arthritis as a prototype and of course our disease of ITP. So first imatinib it works over here. It it completely inhibits the splenic tyrosine kinase. So the downstream signaling of phagocytosis, which is the end result, does not happen. And if you look at um, the comparison over here, um, these were patients who had failed steroids uh, or anti-D, so second line, and also failed some other line and fourth line and fifth line. And if you look at this, um, good number of patients in each of the group, where about 78% um, uh, of patients achieved responses of more than 50,000, and this is for patients who had failed one therapy. And the durability of the response of maintaining counts of more than 50 uh, thousand was about 83 percent so um, this drug got an FDA approval three years ago and uh, not available in Pakistan but it is being used um, in US um, quite frequently. Romiplostin so this drug was initially um, uh, uh, this drug initially approved FDA approval for um, hepatitis induced thrombocytopenia but then it was also used uh, in patients with persistent um, immune thrombocytopenia and this study indicated this study was divided into two groups the first was um, uh, patients of 277 and looking at their plated count uh, in less than one year and then after more than one year so uh, if you look at the two bars over here and you look at the intercortile ranges of the plated count the plated count has remained steady between 50 and 
and almost 150,000. So um, patients, again, um, these are subsequent second line therapies. So patients failing steroids, anti-D um, are then eligible to um, to receive these uh, thrombocoitin receptor um, agonists um, uh, in ITP. Um, the reason why I'm showing this graph is because I want you to see how uh, each of these drugs compare with each other. So romiplostin is subcutaneous, while the other two drugs are oral. This is a major factor over here in prescribing these drugs. Um, so romiplostin, avatrombobike is not available available in Pakistan. Uh, this can be made available as per need basis, but l bag is available in Pakistan, widely used for second line patients um, in ITP. Uh, and about a month's treatment costs about um, anywhere from 90,000 to 100,000 rupees. Um, these are the current indications. Um, and please look at this. Um, here that all of these are used in chronic ITP. These drugs are not indicated <clears throat> as first line therapy. And then there are selected indications going on for investigations. Few include chemotherapy induced thrombocytopenia, and of course, aldrovibac is currently being studied as an acute first line setting um, for uh, ITP. Right, so the last treatment option is splenectomy, again, time in tested, and uh, this is the mechanism of action. This is what the spleen does in ITP. So, um, taking the spleen out is going to halt this FCR blockade destruction of these antibody coated platelets. Uh, the good thing is that in 80%, the platelet counts recover immediately. You clamp the splenic artery, and there is a there is a humongous rise in the platelet count. And of these 80%, about 50 to 60% will achieve durable remission. Uh, and of these 60%, almost 50% are going to relapse in 24 months. So that, that the problem lies over here. What do you do about these 50% of the patients who relapse um, almost after two years? So there's, as always, there should be a strategy. Um, um, the good thing is that there are many medical treatment options and they, uh, they have very few adverse effects. So all of these drugs that I just mentioned have, have got very, very few adverse effects. Um, but the problem is that uh, all of these therapies are not available in all countries. And um, we should make recommendations uh, which should be modified and they should be based on the availability and of course the cost of bearing these um, treatment strategies. Some of these options may require ongoing treatment. You will not be able to stop them anytime soon once you initiate them. Um, and one of the current recommendation is that since we've got these medical uh, treatment options available, if possible, we should defer spinectomy at least for a year where you can try all these medical treatment options and see if your patient responds and save him or her from um, the surgical treatment. With these drugs, there are always general measures that we should take. Uh, we should stop the drugs that reduce platelet function, of course, control blood pressure to avoid intracranial bleed, um, tell patients that they should minimize contact sports uh, that can lead to trauma. Um, so transfusion of platelets, um, have there have been studies which have uh, looked at the efficacy, but again, very poorly studied, uh, not indicated in um, dry uh, ITP patients, but of course, if there is intractable life-threatening bleeding, then platelet transfusion are indicated and the response uh, can be uh, should be assessed clinically rather than looking at the numbers. Um, these are again like corticosteroids, these are the backbone of ITP management which are antiprotonolytics and should be started in all patients who present um, with ITP. So in summary, ITP is poorly understood. It's an ancient disease, but the main pathophysiology is that it is an antibody-mediated suppression of megakaryopoiesis and thrombosis. Um, the mainstay of treatment, um, first-line treatment in ITP steroids. Uh, and adults who fail initial treatment, there are many medical op options available with no um, uh, uh, with no subsequent sequence whatsoever. Um, for thrombopoietin um, receptor agonists, all options are not available in all, all countries. Therefore, we should uh, tailor um, these treatment options according to the availability and, of course, the cost. And general measures um, uh, for treatment in ITP are indicated in all patients uh, once they present uh, to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadasha. Now, session is open for a uh, uh, question. Uh, we have short of time, so please uh, be to the point. 
Well, my question uh, regarding aplastic anemia to Dr. Sabina, that uh, any difference in uh, treatment modalities for very elderly patients, like above the age of 70 years? Patients of aplastic anemia above the age of 70, definitely we can't be aggressive because they have comorbids, they cannot tolerate the uh, chemotherapeutic agents. So I think in these, in the, these uh, patients, the milder drugs like um, um, androgens can be used or the new drugs can be used and with uh, good supportive care. Because uh, other immunosuppressive like uh, cyclosporine, ATGs, they can um, enhance the mortality in these cases. Okay, so, question to uh, Dr. Natasha. Uh, the safety measures to be taken while using Altromovac for the treatment of IDP? Uh, so, you st um, first, you will need to decide the um, when to initiate treatment. So, if the count uh, so for chronic ITP, if the count is 30,000 and above, uh, these these patients do not require any form of treatment. Um, l trombo bag, um, before, pr prior to initiating l trombo bag, we need to look at the liver function tests. Sometimes they may get deranged. And if that is normal, then l trombo bag can be instituted. The recommended dose actually for ITP uh, is 100 milligrams, uh, somewhere between 75 and 100 milligrams. Uh, but we usually start off with 50 milligrams dose and, and then we titrate it according to tolerability. So that's one. Um, in long term use, L trombo bag has um, uh, shown to cause uh, bone marrow fibrosis. Uh, so, you know, if you're using it for over two, uh, uh, two, three years periods of time, maybe, you know, long term period, and if you see that the blood count of your patients by monitoring with CBC starts to fall, you know, if, if the patients develop anemia or, or uh, leukopenia, then maybe that's an indication to get the bone marrow done to rule out bone marrow fibrosis. So that's one uh, main uh, side effect of the drug. Otherwise, it's quite safe. What about ocular assessment? while treating the patient with Alzheimer's? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Th those, uh, that uh, side effect have, has also been uh, noted, but again, these, uh, so the long-term studies have like noted, for example. yes, so the long-term studies have uh, shown this, um, uh, but but this, the, the, the profile and the percentage is so low, um, uh, and the usage of the drug um, has not reached that point right now in our population. So, um, again, uh, six monthly or yearly ocular assessment, and of course, following the CBC regularly of your patients when they are not at In your experience, have you uh, treated patients of chronic ITP with NTD? What is your yes. experience? Yes, we have. We have treated them with anti-D and we've seen about response. We've got a paper out also uh, quite a long time ago and we've seen responses about 35 to 40 percent of patients uh, as a first line treatment. First line treatment people failing corticosteroids. We have used anti-D and we've seen 35, 40 percent responses in these patients. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, add a little bit comment. Uh, on the treatment of ITP as well as on the aplastic anemia. Um, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, so the first presentation regarding the management of uh, aplastic anemia, the place where the MERD was shown, uh, actually, uh, I think that's uh, not where we fall as a country, where to add MERD. Uh, because we really don't have mud facility in Pakistan. So the algorithm is actually needs to be corrected. And recently, uh, there is a review article from BMTC as well on that. So what we can add over there is probably the haplo. Uh, that could be uh, rather a better option to add it over there. Uh, my second comment about is uh, the uh, management of ITP. Uh, most of the studies that I usually whether we discuss over here or see, they are all come from Western population and these are all uh, medical companies sponsored studies. Um, the, the statistics actually um, really doesn't um, adjust to our uh, observation, I would say, because uh, the rituximab in a um, dose of like 375 milligram per meter square, um, where they have shown a result of around 60 to 70, like 60, 68, 62% result. 
uh, actually in our experience it's not more than 30 percent uh, besides uh, including all the uh, complication that uh, you know uh, pre um, like um, that follows uh, the administration of rituximab that is like uh, severe immune suppression for very long time so Thank you very much. Um, here ex exactly again we need to um, like tweak the logarithm treatment logarithms uh, where they have shown the treatment of uh, the splenectomy as like the on the third fourth line management treatment or delayed um, it looks pretty good to add the trombo back uh, as a treatment but to my actual my uh, clinical experience what i have seen is that uh, my patient would prefer to go for a splenectomy because that is like a one-time cost rather than I would prescribe them something that is like a lakh rupees a month which is very difficult um, probably for my patients to afford uh, over a period of like three months four months it's a very hefty amount there are small um, donation programs um, some uh, supportive programs by the Revolate in Pakistan but what I would suggest is that uh, uh, Revolade and all these big companies should support some um, uh, randomized trials in Pakistan uh, for their drugs as they do in the Western population to see what happens and how these medicines actually does in our population. Um, my observation is this, our population is more infectious prone, more susceptible, more, uh, uh, they are less uh, as robust in uh, you know uh, sustaining or uh, to get very uh, you know tough treatments uh, i would say like chemotherapies so there should be some program by the uh, these large pharma companies to support such uh, some randomized trials uh, in pakistan as well thank that you dr Jan 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 thank you very much centers in pakistan uh, bmtc is one of them I am Thank thankful you. to the sp speakers and the, the, the panel session. The, so we end up with this session. Thank you very much.